We've really found out so much and so quickly about our magnificent universe that's happened really in the last decades. Our knowledge has advanced so much. But there are still tons of fascinating, interesting questions. And what is true is that today's astronomers and, and I won't get to answer them all. Um, but happily, someone else will, maybe some people in this room. Thanks. This book is about our quest as humans to understand the bigger world that we're part of, our universe. And it's, it's about finding out about our bigger home. We want to know what's out there that our Earth is just a little bit of a part of. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. A little upbeat music to start this episode of the Into the Impossible podcast with a good friend. And I'm so glad to know that she is my collaborator on the Simons Observatory, a fellow executive member of our executive governance board. And that is Professor Joe Dunkley joining us all the way from Princeton University. How are you, Joe? Very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Joe, you have been a phenomenal uh, inspiration for many reasons, for many millions of people around the world. You are a professor of physics and astrophysical sciences at Princeton University. You've won awards from the Royal Astronomical Society, the Institute of Physics, and the Royal Society for her work on the origins and evolutions of the universe. And we collaborate on the Simons Observatory. I couldn't be more proud. And Joe, what we normally do is do what you're never supposed to do, which is to judge a book by its cover. But, you know, what, what other Bayesian priors do we have, right, Joe? So um, we'll start off by reading the, uh, the, the, um, the title, Our Universe, An Astronomer's Guide by Joe Dunkley. So, Joe, take us through the, how you came up with the concept of the book and what the cover and subtitle really are supposed to convey. Well, so this this book actually came up originally when I was over in the UK. I was working there before I moved over to the States. Um, and actually, so it, 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 it popped up um, in um, as part of the um, Pelican Guide of Books, Pelican series of books, actually, which is supposed to be introductions to topics of interest to kind of the lay public, people who would have some, you know, an education, but wouldn't have had a particular education or training in these areas of, you know, that go into more details about things that often people think are maybe overwhelming or too difficult to comprehend. <clears throat> and so the idea was to, you know, write something that anyone could read and, and learn more about, you know, this beautiful universe around us and to really keep the level, you know, at a pitch that you don't need, you know, a degree in physics or really any equations either to to pick up some kind of difficult concepts. And it's very successfully done uh, as such because it's uh, it's not only informative, even for a professional astronomer, but it's also uh, extremely well written and uh, delightfully researched. And my favorite are the illustrations because they're very whimsical, uh, but they're very informative. Let me get one up here that has. Uh, right, one of the classic illustrations of space-time bending on a trampoline. And I, I love the fact that you um, don't shy away from, from going very deep and actually talking in great depth about some of these concepts, including things like the acceleration of the universe, the composition of stars and how they're made and how they're nuclear fusion reactors, the size scale of the universe. You have unique analogies. Um, that I guess you worked on with with uh, somebody or you credit at the acknowledgments to somebody at Princeton, I guess. Can you talk more about your collaborator on the concepts of the, some of the illustrations? Yeah. So, so, yes, absolutely. I think there's two. So so one thing about the illustrations, I sort of had in my mind the sort of when, when I'm, you know, as a professor, when I'm explaining something to a student or someone who I'm trying to teach something to, we typically use a chalkboard. You know, we, we, we try and simplify diagrams. You get a piece of chalk and you sort of draw the simplest thing you can to get across a concept. And so these, these diagrams that I put in the book were kind of inspired by that concept of like, this is what I would draw on a chalkboard if I was to be trying to explain to someone the you know the the basic idea so they're not fancy they're not you know the, you know you can go to the the web or other other books for the beautiful images we have of our cosmos this was to try and get the concepts in mind um yeah but but but, but then i worked the a lot of the content and yeah this the kind of ideas for how to explain these things um i picked up from a, a working with 
two, you know, fantastic women. One, one was a, a, a school teacher, um, Eileen Levine, um, who I taught, co-taught a course with, uh, gosh, about 10 to 15 years ago now in Princeton, um, where we brought in teachers from New Jersey um, to do a week-long course on astronomy and cosmology. And the idea was that we were teaching teachers new, you know, content they could then take back to their classroom and teach their and teach to their classes. Um, and we got a lot of the content of that from a NASA educator, Lindsay Bartoloni, who's who who had who who showed me so many of the wonderful materials that NASA had created for educators to use in the classroom as well. So we kind of put together this course based on this these you know this 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 wonderful body of, of, of work. And then I learned so much from Eileen as a teacher who was like, that's too complicated. We've got to make this easier. <laughs> you, know, you can't say that that's too difficult. Um, and we, I think got, got down to a level that was, that, that worked. Yeah. I think it's, uh, something that, um, uh, that CS Lewis coined, uh, the curse of knowledge, <clears throat> which is that the more, that you know, someone becomes erudite and figuring things out. You basically stop being able to relate to your former self when you know he or she didn't know these uh, advanced concepts, gravitational lensing and uh, origin of the universe. But um, I think the the skill, and I think that's exemplified in in your book, is uh, is really in, in, indicative of the fact that you can relate to readers who are experts, you know, like me, and then but also novices at this field. Um, I was curious about the hour in the front in what sense is it our universe or because uh, it's an astronomer's guide to our universe uh, are you saying that uh that the general public can understand and appreciate the universe as much as an astronomer or sometimes i feel it's, it's the reverse we don't really appreciate what we do and how privileged we are to be astronomers so what is the meaning of our in the title i wanted to you know convey this this feeling which I believe to be true, which is that this is our home, right? That we are, it's our universe. It's, it's the place where we live. So as an aside, you know, we don't know if there are maybe more universes out there. There's, there's yeah. this kind of, there's, there's this mystery, I think, where I should, that. shouldn't yep. assume that what we can see is all there is. So there is one kind of, there's the kind of possessive of like, I'm just going to try to describe the bit that we know of, you know, that's in one sense, our universe. I'm not going to try and, you know, speculate too much on what else there could be. But I do think this concept of like, this is our home. It's our, we live on earth, but I want people to feel that this bigger place is also something that people can feel, you know, not ownership of, but belonging to, you know, we belong to this bigger place. And in the same way that, you know, we like to learn, we can live in a particular, you know, I might live in Princeton, New Jersey, but I want to know what else is out there in the world. I want to know, um, you know, what other countries there are, what other people there are this idea of that we're just taking that those boundaries a little further um, about learning what other things there are out there as well. But it's right. still kind of part of our whole home and our home, our whole story. It's often said that you learn a lot when you teach. Um, I find that. Um, and you're a renowned teacher as well. Uh, do you feel that you learned even more by writing the book? Are there any things that surprised you in writing the book? Or were you so expert as 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 one of the preeminent cosmologists of of our of our time, did you feel like ah, oh, this is? I just want to explain it to people. But do you do you, did you actually learn anything new in the writing of the book? The thing I learned the most was actually the stories of some of the scientists. Um, and and what sort of happened a little bit by accident is that I got really um, drawn in by by the personal stories. And in particular, to me, I was drawn by a lot of the women scientists who I certainly knew of, but didn't know so many of the kind of the, the, the facets of their lives. And, and so I think probably I knew that the science that I describe in the book, I, I knew most of that science already, but the, the way the stories of the people and the way the things happened were things that I then learned more about in, in writing this. And that was, that was really fun for me. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, <clears throat> and of course, you uh, received the Rosalind Franklin Award, and the book has a wonderful encomium uh, from Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, uh, who says, this book is simply superb, beautifully written and very clear. It incorporates all the major recent results and indicates what might come from telescopes now being built. And I want to thank you, uh, by the way, 
for you know for including her story or uh, speaking about her so uh, so uh, accurately and so and so um, decisively her contributions were to astronomy uh, and it inspired me last week just as I finished reading the book for a second time your book uh, to reach out to her. And uh, she's going to be a guest actually coming on the show. And she's coming on my show on December 10th. Now, I don't know if you know what December 10th means, if, if you recall from my book or from other things you might know. Do you know whose date of death that was? Uh, I, I dare. You'll have to tell me. <laughs> if you look behind me, there's, uh, there's some hints. So the Nobel Prizes are given out every year on uh, December 10th which is the day I'm going to interview Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And one of the things I'm going to ask her is uh, about the fact that she was uniformly regarded as having been snubbed for the Nobel Prize won by uh, her PhD advisor and, uh, and, and another British scientist. Uh, of course, you're, you won the Rosalind Franklin Award. Talk about the status of women and where you see things. Is astronomy uh, you know, sort of uh, exceptionally you know, better, worse? How are we doing? Uh, a lot of our colleagues on the Simons Observatory are women. Our spokesperson is uh, Professor Suzanne Staggs, uh, and she is, uh, you know, she's a, a phenomenal leader of many projects, not only the Simons Observatory. Talk about how women have, you know, um, come forth since the time of Dame Brett Bell Burnell's work, uh, Rosalind Franklin, if you want to go back that far, C.S. Wu, if you want to go back even further. Talk about, you know, how you see things uh, in astronomy. Uh, is, is there improvement or do we have a lot long road to go? I think it's a bit of both. I think there's been significant improvement in the numbers of women who are in astronomy. Um, and I see them now, you know, at, emerging at the senior level as well. Um, although I will say that at the senior level, it's wonderful to see people take on leadership of institutions. I see you know, Risa Wexler at, in Stanford. Um, now just Julianne Dalcanton has been announced as new director of uh, Center for uh, Computation Astrophysics. I, just, it, it, I keep seeing, uh, you know, wonderful, exciting announcements of senior women astronomers taking, uh, you know, leadership roles. Um, and at the same time, we are seeing more junior women come through as well. So I'm, I'm overall positive. And if I look even around the physics department where I work, overwhelmingly, the largest number of women are in the area, the subfields of, of astronomy. Um, compared to other areas of physics. Now, that's not to say we I should we shouldn't be working harder in, in across physics, but I think astronomy is uh, you know is is doing pretty well. But I don't think we're you know we're not we're not we shouldn't feel too complacent because I think there are still challenges and we're still you know not represented fully. Um, yeah. But I think to me actually what I'm what I'm also realizing is you know as a as a white woman that like there are, there's a, there's an issue with lack of representation of women, but there's a much actually larger issue of representation across, you know, broader racial and other diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> you don't uh, probably know this, but I'm calling you or speaking. I am in the office formerly occupied by Jeffrey Burbage, uh, who along with his uh, far more uh, accoladed wife, uh, um, uh, uh, Margaret Burbage did some of the foundational work of the 20th century in astronomical observations. And in fact, I am, uh, blessed to have some of Margaret's old plates that she took before, long before you were born. And even a couple of months before I was born in the, uh, in the early 1970s. And these are, I treasure these and it's in her own handwriting and I just love these. Um, but it's impossible not to kind of, you know, recognize that the kind of challenges that she was uh, facing and, and how things might've changed. And she was famous for turning down certain awards because they were only offered to women. Uh, but you're right. And I think, you know, the challenge I feel, and I was talking about this earlier this week, but, um, you know, there's, there's a twofold challenge in increasing representation. We all want to do it. Uh, but we're also, you know, it, there's a sense that that the past was really bad and, and we do want to make things much better. But it's almost like we're we feel like we want to make sure that we do it the right way, that we don't burden our colleagues. I have a colleague who's an African-American neurobiologist here um, and, uh, you know, he's always asked to do stuff. You know, he's always asked to be on committees and serve and, and like assuage how d different people are feeling and make them feel better. Anyway. As a woman, does that happen as well? In other words, are you put on all these committees for women and status and award? And and is that also sort of like a tax that women have to pay, perhaps that male astronomers like myself don't? I think so. Yes, I think that I will say I think that you know senior members, certainly of my colleagues, have been careful to try and protect me from that. But it happens nonetheless because mm. you may not be asked. I think I'm not probably asked to do that much formal um, work in that respect because people are aware of that tax. 
but it's the informal uh, or, or or it's it's the informal work of, for example, talking to which I love, but talking to junior junior women and 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 sometimes addressing issues that have to be brought up, you know, informally. People might come and talk to me because they will see me as someone as a woman who you know who they might be able to bring things to. Um, so I and I, so yeah, I do I do definitely feel there is an extra tax, and some of it is invisible, and some of it's visible, and so being aware of both those parts, I think just people need to keep aware of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had you know Katie Mack on a couple of years ago, long before her book, and she was saying you know it's it's often very uh, trivialized, like oh just give a girl you know a pink circuit board and uh, that'll be enough, and <laughs> but also that she doesn't really want to talk about it all the time, and so I actually don't want to talk about it uh, that much more either, except to bring up that Margaret left this plate, and of course she was part of the duo that discovered how, uh, the, the quartet, who discovered how nuclear fusion worked inside of stars to produce the elements that you and I are made of, and, and meteorites that are the villains of certain books. Um, but I want to ask you about some of her more controversial other associations, maybe guilt by association, and that has to do with the origin story itself of the universe. And they believed, along with uh, Fred Hoyle, a uh, renowned cosmologist, that the universe didn't have a singular origin. And yet, in this book, you make a very convincing argument that there was a single kind of Big Bang, and there's a lot of information associated with it. Um, is there room for doubt? I, I spoke to a fellow uh, countryman and, and actually a, um, a student of Fred Hoyle, Giant Narlikar. And he still has his doubts about the Big Bang. Is there room for doubting the Big Bang paradigm, shall we say? Is there still room for legitimate, not cranks, not crackpot, but legitimate criticism of the Big Bang? So I would say that, you know, when I talk about the Big Bang and there being a beginning, um, I'm talking about the, you know, the beginning of the growth of the universe we see around us today. So I think there's there's huge open questions about what that what that point at which we call the Big Bang started from, where there was time before there, where there was something before then. I think you know that you you, you think about this a lot too. This this question of 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 um, could it have come from something prior to what we call the Big Bang? Was there something around before? So I I would not I don't think our current data tell us about whether what happened or whether there was something around before our expansion began. But mm -hmm. I think that the model we have that like, yes, some, some growth has been happening from a hot big, that things were in a hot, dense state, you know, 14 billion years ago and have grown since then following our, our um, this model of expansion and following the laws of gravity. There's so much data now for that. I just don't, I, I don't buy <laughs> a lot of, you know, concerns about that because we have so much evidence. We have, you know, we can look at the the proportions of different elements in the universe. We see this, you know, this radiation from from the Big Bang just after the Big Bang itself. This cosmic microwave background that we both study, um, and and so much data now with the beautiful telescopes we have that I think that story is. While there are big questions in it, I think that story is is has become robust. Yes. And I think, you know, you mentioned it earlier on in the beginning of the conversation about the, you know, concept that it might not be the only universe. It might just be our universe. And you talk a lot in the book about, um, about, uh, you know, how the universe is, uh, has the appearances as if inflation took place, this early energetic phase of cosmic, uh, cosmic, I wouldn't say Genesis. And I think a lot of people conflate the two. Um, that inflation doesn't necessarily have to be the Big Bang, right, Joe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what what is most promising about inflation in your uh, as an expert? And then what are some of the most significant challenges and things you would like to see shored up? Because you actually give it a very fair treatment. You mentioned our mutual friend Paul Steinhardt, two-time guest on the Into the Impossible podcast. And unlike many other you know, guests that I've had on, you don't assume it's a fate accompli, as our French friends would say. So talk to me about uh, Steelman, the arguments against inflation, and then uh, let's dive into what the, what the good parts of inflation are. Well, so one of the things that is, one of these fascinating questions that inflation manages to, to address at least, I'm not sure convincingly solve, but it's, it's one of these open questions. It wasn't really what first inspired inflation, but you know, we see cosmic structure in the universe. We see galaxies in the sky, like in 
distributed in this in, in a beautiful cosmic web. Um, and the universe, the universe is full of features. But if we step back to, you know, the very early times, it was almost featureless. It was kind of this soup of particles, almost completely, you know, uniform density throughout throughout space. But, you know, we had to find that that almost featureless universe wasn't completely featureless. There were these tiny lumps, these tiny overdense regions in the early universe. And they were the seeds of these cosmic structures. They were the things that then grow by gravity over millions and billions of years to form this beautiful universe around us now. Um, and one of the huge questions we have is how, why were the, there are these irregularities in the early universe, in this soup of particles? Why were there little regions that were ever so slightly denser than others that then would be this, the seeds of everything to come later? And inflation, which is this, you know, the idea that, that the universe expanded extremely fast, faster than the speed of light, just for a very short time, it, 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 it kind of solves that um, in a beautiful way, I think. And I think it's kind of a, this, this like amazing mixture of the quantum mechanics of the very tiny with the, you know, the, the general relativity of the very large, that, that, that tiny quantum fluctuations in the very early universe um, where where particles are kind of allowed to appear and disappear because of our uncertainties of that, that quantum mechanics tells us we should be uncertain of, um, those combined with a universe that's growing exponentially fast kind of freezes in these 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 little ripples, these quantum ripples, into huge macroscopic enormous scales that then become the seeds of everything else. Mm. Um, and that is a love, you know. That's 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 beautiful. Like the idea that you could that this works and that that this this kind of matching up of like tiny quantum fluctuations expanded enormously, and then they grow. Then the galaxies that we see, that's very beautiful. Um, trouble is, and, and that that um, that even though sort of part of the inflationary models predicts that indeed you should get these these little ripples in the way that we see them there are real problems with the theory as well like it's it 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 says that there's also high chances of getting something looking completely different um and so this is like you know the, the people who are saying oh this actually isn't this, this model doesn't really work so well say that that actually there are more there's more you're more likely to get a universe that looks nothing like the one we've got than this particular one where, which has these you know elegant little fluctuations that that match up what we see um so i there, there are that to, to me like this whatever 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 was going on has to explain how we got these this initial you know the initial conditions of the universe it's got to explain that um but there are you know other ideas out there Mm. And <clears throat> when we think about those ideas, sometimes I have, you know, friendly arguments with my friends, Paul and Anna Aegis and others who promote this because eventually their model in bouncing cosmology has to incorporate something like a scalar field. I always tell them, I say, Anna, you know, Paul, can't you do it without a scalar field? In other words, don't replace the, you know, the kind of unknown, unknown within inflation uh, which is a scalar field, which we have no evidence of, you know, currently, I mean, there is only one known scalar field, which is the Higgs. Um, still, uh, how, you know, how nice would it be to not have to have this feature? So I, I kind of feel like it even will retain all these cosmological alternatives and even Sir Roger Penrose's aeons and cyclic cosmology. They still retain some kind of scalar field for which we have no evidence. So I guess the concept, the question I have is, how should we evaluate these things? I mean, inflation is stunningly successful, but it cannot account for its own origin. It, in order to account for its origin, it must invoke the multiverse. Um, and so does, does that trouble you, or is that just really a signpost that we need better ideas? I think we certainly need better ideas. I think that... Um you know what, what it is remarkable that there are there are a set of predictions from inflation that we have sort of checked off most of them already we we're, we're now uh together right we look we're looking for one of the key predictions of the early universe of the inflation model of the early universe which is that it should imprint space time ripples gravitational waves permeating the early universe um and so we 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 should we should certainly look for them 
But I think even if we find them, I wouldn't be ready to say, oh, inflation happened. Like, this is, exact, this is what it is. You know, problem solved. We actually did do that in 2014, you might remember. Well, we did. But, e- but even, even if that result had been right, I think, you know, we, yeah, we, we, that, that was a, it, was, it was not even, that was a mistaken result. Yeah. But even if we had found them, and even when we do, I hope we do find them with Simon's Observatory, or maybe I should hope we don't because that might tell us, Something interesting, something interesting too. I'm, I'm not sure what I hope. Um, <laughs> um, even then, we're still going to have this gap where we will say, uh, still, you know, do I know what inflation is and why it happened? Mm. Um, and so I, 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 I think that there are still, I think there are issues. And I think um, having more clever minds thinking about these these theoretical models for the early universe, I think is really important. I feel like we don't quite have enough right now. I feel like we've got this dominant paradigm, which is inflation. We have these 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 um you know interesting alternatives, bouncing models, but we don't have whole communities of other you know theoretical cosmologists thinking up other alternatives or subtleties of this. And I I, I sort of wish we did. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to nerd out a little bit now because my audience, the Into the Impossible audience, is nothing if not the smartest, most brilliant minds in the multiverse. Uh, your thesis titled, The Modern Methods for Cosmological Parameter Estimation Beyond the Adiabatic Paradigm. Uh, first of all, uh, we've had a lot of people on Julian Barbour, who you probably know from Oxford. Uh, he was on the show talking about this entropic arguments that he has for the origin of the universe. An Englishman, but he's not English. His name is England, Jeremy England. We talked about uh, life and the connection of entropy to the origin of life and evolution. But I want to ask you, uh, first of all, what does adiabatic mean in the context of cosmological perturbations and how does that fit into the inflationary paradigm and then we'll and then we'll go deep <laughs> yeah good so it's a funny word it's, it's a word that's used in other other ways in in other parts of physics but it, in it's a word that we we use in cosmology for saying you know i, I said i mentioned earlier we, we we have these sort of lumps and bumps in the early universe and the sort of theory inflation says that before we had any particles we had a scalar field and we don't know what that is but we're saying we had the scalar field and that it was the thing that these quantum fluctuations left the irregularities in. Um, and, and so then we think that that decayed or changed into the particles we know. So the, the, the sort of baryon, the particle, normal baryonic particles that we are made of, rays of light, photons, neutrinos, and we think also dark matter particles that are also rather mysterious. If that if that's sort of what happened, then all of those particles, all of those different different ingredients, the particles, the light, the neutrinos, they should all inherit the same lumps and bumps as went into that initial scalar field. So anywhere in the universe that was kind of an overdensity of energy in the scalar field, that will then turn into an overdensity of both the particles and the rays of light and the neutrinos and the dark matter all in one place. And so the adiabatic sort of assumption is indeed that that any overdense region uh, in the early universe is going to be similarly overdense in all of the ingredients of the universe. It's not like you'll have one lump of matter over here and over here you'll have a lump of photons. They need to trace each other. Like if you imagine drawing, I go to my blackboard is not right behind me. If I imagine drawing a line tracing the density of the universe with space, the density of the light and the matter and the dark matter, and everything in it should follow the same pattern. Um, and, and that's, again, what simple inflation would predict because it all came from this scalar field. Um, right. And when we think about adiabatic or entropy, one of the main um, kind of uh, attacks on inflation is that it it doesn't – it makes the problem of the – uh, arrow of time, you know, particularly uh, pernicious because it's it's really saying the universe had this extremely low entropy state in the beginning, but it almost has to be added by hand. How does the entropy behave? Let, let's say something happens at the Planck time. We don't understand what inflation happens, you know, 10 to the eighth Planck times later, 10 to the minus 36 of a second. Then it lasts for 10 to the minus 35 of, I don't know, 10 to the, <laughs> some small amount of time. Mm-hmm. And, and then it emerges. Uh, and it, but it has to emerge in this low entropy state. Um, wrap my mind, my audience's mind around that. How does that, how does that get accomplished so that it is actually adiabatic 
not just thermal equilibrium, which you know you could kind of make sense, although it's it's hard to really think about thermalization of the entire uni- what would become the entire universe effectively. But but nevertheless, how how does the low entropy get asserted if not by fiat, which most cosmologists find anathema? Yeah, well, so I think we're miss- we're certainly missing big pieces of the story. At this, still, we 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 usually actually we usually you know usually. Um, uh, when we're tracing through how these like perturbations evolve, we just give them an initial condition. And we're saying, I think what I'm saying is that, you know, if we assume that these fluctuations came from inflation, then we say, okay, we had some kind of, we had uh, at the end, inflation ended, we decay and produce particles. Um, but there's still, uh, you know, big uncertainties about that, even that process. But so I think, but, but then in, from sort of when we then, do cosmology onwards, right? We we say, okay, I'm just going to start with some initial conditions of these ingredients, and I and I'm not going to exactly worry right now about how I got from the scalar field into this initial conditions of those particles. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, one the, plenty of people are working on that, but if we're trying to say what do the what are the observables in the universe, we tend to just say, right, what are these? What are the initial conditions of these different ingredients? Mm-hmm. Um, we don't we don't then have to model that earlier bit. Yeah. I agree. It's very interesting to understand, try and figure out. Yeah. Exactly. I would say, you know, if you, if you want to study, you know, embryology of a chicken or something, you don't actually have to come up with the, how the DNA got in the chicken's, you know, egg in the first place uh, to understand which came first, the chicken or the egg. Uh, But nevertheless, it's interesting. And it's always kind of adjacent. It's like, I have, uh, I'll have a famous astronomer. Actually, I had Sarah Seeger uh, over the other night for dinner in San Diego, and uh, she's a world-renowned astronomer and a guest past guest on the Into the Impossible podcast. And we were just lamenting the fact that how few astronomers can identify most constellations. I'm not going to put you to the test because I know you can. Uh, but the uh, but Sarah and I were joking. But I'm all, it's 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 not too surprising that we get asked about these big picture questions as cosmologists, right? Because we're we're studying you know the origin of everything, and so people assume we're going to be philosophically inclined to want to know what came first. Um, but uh, maybe more practical question to answer is I've never fully been comfortable with the notion that you know inflation is super smoother. It makes the universe exquisitely flat during the early radiation dominated phase. But um, but then after ten to the sixtieth e, or e to the sixtieth foldings or whatever it is, um, the best fit model that you and your colleagues have determined um, that it emerges. But then it has ripples and then it has these tiny curvature fluctuations. Um, and those are adiabatic, as you as you discussed in your thesis and elsewhere. Um, how how does that work? Like, is that another fine tuning problem? I guess that's my question for you in a, in a concise form. Does it have to be because if they if the perturbations were present before the enormous expansion, then they too would get you know di- diffused and flattened out um, because they would just amplify outside the horizon. Uh, yeah. Well, I, so the perturbations are appearing during the expansion. So every so every time. So we're, we well. We, we've got little quantum fluctuations that are present um, uh, at every scale of the, of the universe's space a, as it is at the time. And so as we inf- as this inflation says I'm exponentially expanding space. So every time I uh, you know expand double double space space time, um, I'm imprinting these fluctuations, which is why again we see them. We see these this particular scale invariance. We see fluctuations that look the same whether we look at like really really big scales or really small scales. Um, so those because they're being imprinted during the inflation itself. If they've been imprinted, if they were there beforehand, you could imagine they might have been you know washed out. But like they're they're actually coming in during inflation itself. Um, Due to from the you know from the physics of the of the universe growing coupled with these quantum fluctuations, so you end up so that then they get fro- you know so essentially frozen in on big you know on visible macroscopic scales during it, um, and but it is this lovely thing that like that makes a quite a specific prediction that because inflation had to end and it slowed down, you actually even though you get almost as the kind of same size features at very large angular scales are small, you actually get like slightly um, um, slightly smaller features at the smallest scales. Um, and that's a departure the, just for the listen, that's a departure of NS from unity. Yeah, that's exactly. Right. And what I mean it's been it's been really exciting because it's only been since the Planck satellite that you know we saw this for the first time high significance. 
that actually that's indeed what we see is this departure from from scale invariance. And so, yeah, I guess we, we are we are actually seeing the kind of if indeed that comes from inflation, again, it might not. Right. Uh, we're seeing that kind of the the evolution of like how the expansion went during that during those efaults. And how? What else? You you put in a little caveat there with uh, appropriate candor. But what other models would predict a departure that could be seven sigma or five, whatever you guys have measured it to, significant departure from NS from one? Um, what you know? I mean, in other words, what uh, what other alternative models, or is it just other models of inflation that pr- could predict it and I, evade that test? Yeah, I, my 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 impression is that even though. It's very nice. So it is. It is pretty compelling to me. That 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 I think was one of the most important results of the Planck satellite was this was this measurement, um, and it it has made non-inflation builders' life I think more challenging because of this because it is rather specific, um, yes. and so I I feel sure that there can be other ways of doing it. I would say either there are two things. Either there's a different way of doing it, or we there's still a possibility that that we've got it that it's not less than one because if you want to throw in some other strange physics you know we, we get these numbers from the universe by looking at our, our observations very carefully but we make assumptions and so in, in in detecting this ns less than one this slight scale invariance we've assumed everything else about the model of the universe we've assumed that it's what we call lambda cdm it's this flat universe it's got only three ingredients etc we might have got some of that a bit wrong still, even though we don't think so, even though we're sort of, you know, we've done our best so far to say, you know, given all we know, this is our best model. There might still be some new physics in there, some some new some new model behavior that that actually could give some diff- slightly different, some infer some different scale dependence, even from the data we have in hand. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people say things like, you know, inflation's prediction of a flat universe um, is not really a prediction. It shouldn't count as a prediction, um, <clears throat> or, or even uh, you know, or it's it's not even a problem in some sense. Um, what do you make of that? Uh, the classical pillars on which inflation's credulity rests are the observed flatness, absence of spatial curvature, the observed um, you know uh, the isotropy of the microwave background, but not perfectly isotropic, and then uh, and then the absence of magnetic monopoles, which is a non-observation. So I, I agree, we really and that was Goose's original motivation, as I'm under, uh, led to understand. What do you make of the flatness? Should should we stop using it as a justification that inflation is well motivated? No, I think I think the flat the fact that our universe is does appear to be almost perfectly or exactly geometrically flat, which means you know light travels in parallel lines. That it's that it's not. Uh, that it probably stretches out and stretches out. It's you know not like the surface of an orange, but like the surface of a piece of paper. Um, that is a surprising um, measurement if we made no assumptions about the early universe. Because and I remember, you know, this is one of the things I remember doing as an under you know undergraduate um, is you can derive that you know you can show that if you just have some departure from perfect flatness of the universe and you just let it evolve it will get much more, much less flat. And that's this big, that was this big problem. It's like this incredible fine tuning you need at the very beginning of the universe, yeah. that the universe starts off incredibly close to flat if it's going to look pretty flat today. Mm-hmm. And so that is no, any, any, any viable model has got to address that. Um, and so that was one of the reasons, one of the things that inspired inflation. But so, so, so yeah, and anything that's not that better, better address that issue. Right. And then, uh, the final thing that I hear a lot about, and I'd love to get your, uh, professional professorial opinion reminder. We're talking with professor Joe Dunkley, Princeton university, renowned cosmologist, friend and collaborator on the Simons observatory. It's such a pleasure to talk to our friends. And this interview has been uh, two years in the making since our universe came out and I've been dying to get you on the show and something happened in the world, uh, of, uh, health related matters that we're not going to talk about that delayed many, uh, times our interviews with our kids and our schedules. Uh, but we're talking about, uh, right now, some of the nitty gritty nerding out on inflation. Uh, so one thing I'm often let her, uh, led to believe from inflation is that it predicts, uh, something about quantum gravity. In other words, an observation of primordial, uh, B mode perturbations would in some sense validate 
the notion that gravity was quantized uh, during the inflationary epoch. What do you make of those kinds of claims? And in what sense is is a B mode, a classical B mode, gravitational wave, and and GR is a classical theory, as you know better than anybody. Um, in what sense is the observation of a classical gravitational wave any bearing on whether or not gravity is quantized? Well, I think it depends on your model. So when what, what we're all looking, you know, we're busy looking for this this imprint of gravitational waves um, on the cosmic microwave background, and um, but the, the, and the physics of that doesn't, uh, you know, is not necessarily assuming that gravity is quantized. You know, we, we've seen the gravity that those beautiful gravitational waves already from in spiraling black holes from LIGO, and it's again, it's just a it's a prediction of relativity. Um, and so if we find that imprint from the early universe, I don't think we're instantly saying uh, anything more than we have found that signal. You know, we've seen, gra- we, we, we can first of all say, you know, yes, we've seen gravitational waves um, produced from some mechanism in the early universe. I don't think we can then say with certainty, it therefore must have come through this, you know, this, this, this mechanism where I've come, I've, you know, quantized gravity, I've come from quantum fluctuations, et cetera. Um, but, but it's certainly, but it's one of the parts. I think if we, of course, if we see them, if we detect them, then, you know, people will be busy exploring these options and trying to determine how, with, with what certainty we could say that is what happened. But I think that we won't be able to say that with, um, I expect with, you know, there, there will still be options, I suspect, for, you know, other possible um, mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And when we look at the inflationary paradigm, you know, one complaint I hear about it is that, you know, it's kind of like string theory. It, it takes up all the, you know, best and brightest young minds and and there are too few people working on alternatives to inflation. Um, do you think that's a problem? Do you think there should be, you know, I had Michio Kaku on who is, you know, is the father of string field theory along with other people. And, and I asked him, well, you know, how much should we spend on alternatives? to uh to string theory and he said well 50 50 you know and i thought that's you know if i made you um uh director of the nsf which maybe someday you will be but uh but if i made you uh you know in charge of of funding and so forth would you how would you allocate balance the portfolio of research that's done by theorists your theoretical colleagues well and one thing i would say is i think there were so many you know the the origin of the universe is a huge question there are other huge questions too even in cosmology you know the the, the may or may not be connected about the, um, you know, the invisible universe, the dark universe. Um, but within the early, within the early universe modeling, um, I think it's really important to support the alternative models, uh, modeling or, or thinking, thinking of alternatives. Um, and, you know, but, but in that respect, I'm biased. I always want to have the, have a strong focus on now let's figure out what to measure. Um, and connect those 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 theories to what are we best what should we best go and measure to really give as many possibilities to the theorists and and one example that you know we're doing with the Simons Observatory is we're not only looking for gravitational waves that are kind of one of the things that people are looking for for inflation but we're also going to measure these like tiny flux the, the tiny ripples in space time that produce galaxies at really fine scales to try and get a broader lever arm on what they look like. Because as I said said before, you know, the Planck satellite has said, yeah, these these fluctuations look almost scale invariant and they follow this this pattern. But we must go and look for anything else that could be telling us something new. So I think perhaps what I'm saying is that that observations, if I was fund, you know, funding projects, you want to fund, I think, things that give you the most information possible, not perhaps about just one facet, but like about, you know, many different views of a problem. And then, yeah, ideally supporting a uh, variety of theory theorists. Uh, so at the end of the book, uh, you conclude with a beautiful passage. You say, the most exciting discoveries are the ones we least expect, ones that can radically change what we thought was true and ultimately lead us to a better understanding of our wider world. We look forward to them with eager anticipation. I always think it's it's kind of funny when I say like, oh, we have to look for serendipity <laughs> because by definition, you're not going to do it. But what do you say to people that, you know, say, look, you know, the Simons Observatory or some other experiment, 
you know, we're basically not going to be able to say that inflation definitely took place, as you just said, if we detect B modes, because something else could purport it. Or we're not going to be able to rule out inflation either, right? Because inflation could have occurred, but at too low an energy regime to create observable uh, primordial perturbations. Other goals involve, you know, looking for evolution of dark energy. Well, that doesn't seem to really have any hints that it's really quintessence or evolving dark energy. Uh, and then looking for neutrino masses. Uh, and, well, we have a good lower bound and we have a good upper bound. We just don't know the exact results. So why is it important to do these measurements with precision? Why, why is that important? And, and is serendipity, as much as we love it, is that is that a good justification for doing scientific research? I think ideally you want to be able to have an experiment that can do both. I think, you, you, of course, you need to build something where there is something that you're, you're, you're after. And, and neutrinos are an interesting example, actually, because we know that neutrinos exist and we know that they have mass and we don't know what they are, what that mass is. We don't actually know if they behave cosmologically like we think they do. So there actually is huge scope for discovery there, I think. There's a whole sector of particles that we, that we really don't fully understand. So to me, that's an interesting area where, you know, you say, yes, I'm going to build an experiment that can go and measure the neutrino mass, assuming they behave in the universe like they seem to do here on Earth or in the local local universe. But then I think you want to build, try and build your experiments in a way that say, um, that give you the most opportunity to find, uh, you know, stranger behavior that you didn't, that you weren't sure of. Um, so I do think that the ideal experiments we're seeing that with large cosmological surveys, actually, that you build them to target a few key questions, and then you collect a huge amount of data and realize, you know, that you could actually look for things in different ways and hopefully find something new. So um, I think my favorite, my favorite experiments have a bit of both, you know, and obviously, they're they're probably not going to get supported unless they have a bit of the first one, which is something that you actually think is, (laughs) is worth going to measure. Okay, so for the last nerding uh, uh, adjacent question, I want to talk about um, N effective. This is probably the least known, but maybe the most interesting parameter that Simon's Observatory and other projects can go after. Uh, what is N effective? Why do we expect there to be a departure from the standard model? And maybe you can talk about what the standard model predicts for N effective. And um, you know, what do you think our prospects are? Yeah. So, so what this number N effective it characterizes the mostly characterizes the number, to begin with, just the number of types of neutrino particles in the universe, of which we are pretty sure there are three. That's what we've measured, um, uh, you know, lab-based and and local measurements. Um, But that number, in a broader sense, cosmologically, measures how many actually just in general relativistic particles there are, um, or species of particles, where relativistic particle is something that certainly in the early universe, was traveling, you know, almost at the speed of light. And again, we think that it's just three neutrinos, but there may be more particles out there. Um, and many models for the early universe would say, well, actually, yeah, there should be, there should have been additional kind of particles created in the early universe that would also be left behind streaming through a universe now. And the subtlety is if they were produced, um, or if they sort of stopped interacting with other particles much earlier on than the neutrinos did, then they would then they would sort of look in our data as if they were some fraction of a number. So we talk about this number like the number of particles, the effective number of particles, but an extra kind of species of like a novel new relic particle might only contribute like a tenth of a of a of a of a number of particles. So it might be that we go out and we measure not three, but 3.1 as this number. And 3.1 would be really exciting because it would say that there was actually some additional, you know, density stuff in the universe made of rapidly traveling particles that are not in our current standard model of physics. Um, so uh, sadly, we well, not purpose on sadly, but maybe a bit sadly, we've already ruled out the fact that there's a whole other neutrino species. You know, we went down through a few years ago with our new data. We said, okay, four is ruled out with our data. So anything that is in there has got to be just some fraction of a number, which again corresponds to particles that stopped interacting at a much higher temperature in the universe than neutrinos. But they might be there. And 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 so we're looking for that, 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 that slight departure from three Again, you do expect some official departure from three just because of the fit, just because of like tracking the heat of the early universe. But nonetheless, three neutrinos 
should give a very specific number and any any addition to that will be new physics, new particles. So, and this would be different from, uh, say, the potential dark matter candidate called the axion, correct? So do you want to explain uh, what is an axion? Why do cosmologists get so excited about it? And how can we maybe measure it with experiments like the Simons Observatory? Well, axions are very interesting. So, so it, they're one of the candidates for dark matter. So we have... Um, a huge amount of mass in the universe that's invisible to us, about five times as much mass as, as the matter that we're made of, is, is dark matter. Um, and until quite recently, I think many people assumed that this dark matter was made of um, what we call WIMPs, weakly interactive massive particles, something you know heavier than the electrons, I think things that we're made of. Um, but now that there's sort of renewed interest, I think, or there always was, but there's, I think it's probably an increase lately for axions, very, very light particles to be the source of dark matter instead. Um, and they'd be incredibly, incredibly light, but, you know, but the total energy of energy density of them would be enough to account for this invisible matter. Um, they, they're actually sort of different flavors of them. Some of them could be the dark matter, the sort of the cold, this 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 cold dark matter. They could also be um, uh, contribute a smaller amount of the energy in the universe, and and just be very and and contribute to this number that we're looking for. That's ineffective. It does depend on the kind of the kind of axion, but it's it's um, yeah. We'll 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 just have to see. Yeah, it'll be exciting. Okay, Joe, we've come to the end, but I want to ask you one of my big picture questions and actually relates to uh, the late, great former countryman of yours, uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who said many things, including uh, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. He said, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And he also said, the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to venture beyond them into the impossible. And that's how I got the name of this podcast, because I am the co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. I want to ask you, Joe, what mysterious aspect of life seemed impossible to a 20-year-old Joe Dunkley, but now makes sense and gave you the courage, give yourself the courage and gave you the courage, perhaps, to go into the impossible? Well, I, I, I guess I'll answer that in a, in a slightly, perhaps not the same way as... Uh, as envisaged of, of a knowledge thing, but I, to me, it's the thing of doing something that you didn't think you were capable of, right? So my 20, 30 year old self wouldn't have thought that I could, for example, write a book, right? This seemed impossible. Um, something that seemed something that only, you know, someone else does, right? Not me. Um, and so I think that the thing that I've probably learned in the past in this last 10 years or so is that you can do those things. You can do things that actually seem impossible to do. I had this sort of dream, like I'd love to write, like I'd love to write a book. I'd love to be able to do this. Um, and it seemed impossible. And so then it was some advice and support. I was like, Oh, maybe I can do this. <laughs> and now, you know, it seems like that's, that's something achievable. So I, to me, that's a, it's not a scientific knowledge thing that, that no, that's, that's learning, true. but it's a kind of a, a what your yourself is capable of. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. In fact, it reminds me of what Audrey Hepburn said. The word impossible tells you that nothing's impossible because the word says, I'm possible. <laughs> so uh, a little advice from Audrey Hepburn, great scientist, as I'm sure she was. Uh, but Joe Dunkley, I'm so pleased to be able to talk with you today and to uh, benefit from the wisdom and knowledge in your wonderful book, Our Universe, available everywhere books are consumed. And I just uh, want to add... Uh, Further gratitude for being uh, a member of our collaboration and a leader of it. And I look forward to seeing you next week as our face-to-face -face or screen-to-screen -screen meeting. And I can't wait to hear from you uh, next week, along with all the great stuff you do at Princeton University. Joe Dunkley, thank you so much for going into the impossible. Thanks, Brian. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.